Hello, everybody. Can we take our seats, please? Oh, wow, I didn't think that would work as well as it did. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome. Let me hear a little enthusiasm. Yes. <laughs> welcome to Connects 2019, Business with a Purpose. It's really, really great to see you all here. Spent some time with some of you last night at John Harvard's, uh, having a little fun and talking, and it's always a pleasure uh, to greet people from our HBS online programs here back to campus. One thing I want to do before I forget, in our age of digital media, I would be remiss, I'm going to do a selfie with all of you behind me, which I will tweet out so all of you have it. So, okay, we ready? One, two, three. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, oh, okay, okay, hang on, hang on. All right, here we go. One, two, three. All right, now I need to come over here. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> All right, one, two, three. Awesome. All right, did I get everybody? Uh-oh. We're assuming we'll get the top deck there, too. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm Patrick Mullane. I am the executive director of HBS Online. I've been here almost four years, so I've been here for every one of these events. And uh, as I said a minute ago, they are fascinating and fun for those who haven't been before. I think you'll find it's an event that you'll want to come back to uh, every year. And how about this place we're in this year? Pretty amazing, huh? Yeah, for those, who were, for those who were here two years ago, we were in a place called Burden Auditorium, just a little ways out there, which there's no evidence it ever existed anymore. Um, it was a quite different than this auditorium, so it's wonderful to get to use this for the first time as well. Um, two or three quick announcements before we jump right into our program. Uh, first of all, uh, I mentioned I'm going to tweet out that picture. Uh, it's hashtag HBS Online Connects with the X to uh, communicate with your uh, brothers and sisters who are at this event with you. Uh, secondly, the Coop, which is the bookstore effectively of Harvard, uh, there's one in the basement of Spangler where you registered, where you can buy uh, paraphernalia, hats, shirts, Pens, we got everything probably. Probably have pets in there with it, you know, shaved into their fur. But you can get an HBS uh, online uh, swag there. Also, you can now get it online. If you go to the Coop, so C O O P, is it the Coop or Coop? It's the Coop. Thecoop.com and just search online. You'll be taken to a page that sells HBS online stuff. By the way, we don't get any money for this, so I'm, it, it sounds like I'm pitching here. <laughs> um, but it's just that we get asked so often for this stuff. Uh, we just wanted you all to know that it's available to you. Um, coat room. There's a coat room up uh, to my right here uh, that's going to be staffed all day. Many of you left your coats over in Spangler. That's OK. You know, slight risk of leaving there, probably. If you want to get them back over here to the coat room that's going to be staffed, feel free to do that. Uh, speaking of the coat room, um, we found a Samsung phone with a black case uh, that is being, uh, where's Matt? Matt? Matt, is it uh, this coat room here? Oh, it got claimed. Never mind. We got it. OK, we, we found its home. Awesome. OK, uh, with that, let me introduce our first speaker, who many of you know. How many have taken core or economics for managers as separate? Wow. So you all know uh, Professor Bharat Anand, right? Uh, so <laughs> The thing that's great about Broad, I've heard this from a number of you, is that nobody ever, let's just be honest, voluntarily signs up for an economics course. <laughs> but those of you who, for whatever reason, decided you had to take it found that economics is a lot more interesting and fun than you were probably led to believe. And uh, much of that has to do with the way Broad teaches it with our case method here. Uh, wonderful guy. I've worked with him for three and a half years now. Uh, Barat got his, well, he went to undergraduate here at Harvard, got his PhD at Princeton and then ultimately ended up back here at Harvard. He's currently the vice provost for advances in learning for all of Harvard, so he's in charge of everything dealing with teaching at all of Harvard University, and he also has a foot in our world here, still acting as our senior associate dean, so working with me and leading the direction of Harvard Business School online. So please join me in welcoming Bharat for opening comments. Thanks, yeah, thanks man. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all 595 of you here. 
um, on what is another beautiful sunny day <laughs> in Boston. Uh, we're delighted to have you. This is the third time, as Patrick said, that we're hosting Connext on campus. The fourth time that we're actually doing this. As, uh, as he mentioned, um, part of the reason why we didn't do it last year um, was the place where we usually host these events was being torn down. Um, so Patrick Aveni, if you're around, just as a footnote, just to let you know <laughs> uh, sort of why we're uh, back here now. This is a new building which, um, which was just built in the fall, and we're delighted to have you all um, here. I, I've been talking to some of you this morning and just amazed at where you're coming from. So I just wanted to uh, get a sense from all of you. How many of you, how many of you are, have traveled within the US to come to this event? Just get a sense, wow. How many of you have come from uh, Central or Latin America? Wow. How many from Europe? How many from Africa, Middle East? Welcome. Um, from Asia? Wow. Three from Australia, by the way. I don't know if, <laughs> are you one of them? That's pretty amazing. Welcome. <laughs> Um, anyone from Antarctica? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That is the only place where we don't have folks. What's that? Canada. I'm sorry. <laughs> Canada. <laughs> Wonderful. Welcome to all of you. It's such, a, it's such a pleasure to have you all here for the day. I hope you enjoy the day. Uh, we have a packed schedule for you where we have amazing faculty who will be leading sessions with you, as well as time and chances for networking and just meeting each other. Uh, and I'll come back and speak a little bit more about, uh, about that. Uh, I want to say that uh, this event was fully registered within three days. And, um, and it's, it's both incredible uh, for us to actually see that, but we'll need to figure out a long-term solution, <laughs> OK? <laughs> that is not the long-term solution. <laughs> Uh, so we're, we're going to be giving some thought to that. As many of you know, HBS Online, formerly called HBX, was launched uh, five years ago nearly. Uh, this was June 2014. At that time, there were roughly 500 participants in core. I don't know how many of you can guess how many we've had so far go through our courses. 5,000. 25. Uh, so... It's been uh, 46,000 uh, plus, uh, which is an impressive number. But the thing I want to emphasize is, and this many of you have heard me say this from day one, is that number doesn't mean much to us. Why is that? Because when the 46,000 and first person sits down to take the online course, the fact that many other people took it is irrelevant for their learning experience. All they care about is what am I learning and my cohort of three to 500. And the pedagogy and the learning experience and the platform and the content and the faculty. And I want to say that because from day one, engagement has been the anchor of everything we do at Harvard Business Online. And our premise was that if we can crack the code of engagement, which, by the way, five years ago was a big uncertainty, if we can crack the code of engagement, reach will follow. And I think that's exactly what's happened. Um, it's also that moment when you sit down to take the course is what we often refer to as the moment of truth, um, when everything comes together. By the way, some of you have had multiple moments of truth, <laughs> taking multiple courses. Uh, some of you have taken two. Uh, several have taken three, some four, some five, uh, some six. And I just wanted to call out um, in this group here, people who've taken six or more courses. Richard Pitts, I think, has just signed up for his 10th. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Elena Bose, uh, Kuntal Hazari, Jose Viquez, Carlos Viquez, Brenes, and Roshan Joseph. Um, it's pretty incredible how you keep coming back to us. By the way, next year, I think we might be thinking of introducing a subscription model. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry it's too late for you guys. <laughs> um, so when we receive emails about your experience, we read it very seriously. 
When we receive suggestions about how to improve, we read it very seriously. And I just want to thank you for being with us on this journey. I also want to just take a moment and step back and think about why this journey is important. Um, so, so like many of you, we encounter many friends, colleagues, uh, others in our communities. I've been speaking to a bunch of people over the last several years, chief learning officers at companies who are thinking about enterprise-wide learning. How can we talk about upskilling the entire organization, reskilling the future of work? And we have, in fact, one of our colleagues here who's uh, one of the experts in that, Joe Fuller, who you'll be hearing from uh, shortly. We hear from um, CEOs who are talking about digital transitions and transformations and how to keep up with the pace of change. We hear from uh, colleges and universities talking about how to make education more relevant for changing skill requirements. We, almost every day, hear from friends and family in our community about things like the state of rhetoric today and the nature of discourse and how troubling it's become. In all these cases, solutions are hard to come by, right? They require creativity, they require inspiration. But one of the things I've always found fascinating is inevitably in these conversations, one of the solutions that always comes up, which everyone can agree on, is the promise of education. And in particular, distance education. And that, to us, is our responsibility. That's why we're embarking on this. By the way, it's not an easy responsibility to bear when you realize, as one of my colleagues recently told me, universities are a force for inertia. Okay? We're not a force for change. <laughs> We're a force for inertia. And so against that backdrop, it's truly remarkable, I think, uh, the effort that's gone into creating something that now brings you all here today. Uh, it's been a challenging experience at times for us, a thrilling experience, an inspiring experience, never a boring experience, I can tell you that. And we often talk about change and, and what triggers change in organizations. For me, this experience personally has underscored one important thing. It's all about passion and protection. It's not about giving permission to people. Right? That inevitably follows in organizations. And I just wanted to mention that. Uh, by the way, it's also very heartening when we start seeing the impact of what we're doing, not just to all of you, but beyond. Uh, so when other schools are using our courses in their residential curricula, which is now happening, uh, that to us is a multiplier effect. When we have organizations using our courses in their training, when we now have companies requesting our platform to be used in their internal training, and finally, the biggest compliment I think we received was when Sal Khan recently told us, he said, I'm gonna copy the cold call feature <laughs> in the Khan Academy. Um, it's like mimicry is the best form of flattery. Thank you, Sal, and we can all tweet him out um, for copying HBS online. <laughs> We're excited to be playing a role even there. <clears throat> I think the most exciting thing, frankly, though, is that we're excited you are joining us on this journey. And I just want to turn to that for a second, because that's been some of our biggest surprises and learnings as we've gone through this journey. Talent is located everywhere, everywhere. Aspiration, motivation, commitment are even more widely distributed. And once you put those ingredients together, sort of magic happens. I think, as hopefully you all have experienced in these courses, as we experience every day. But that's what we've created for you, and that's what you've benefited from, hopefully, in the learning experience. I want to spend a couple minutes just talking about responsibility, right? Uh, which is, you all now have a responsibility. Not just to learn, but to share. Not just to share with your colleagues or friends, or with your organizations, or to society, but frankly, to each other. Because this community is built by your individual stories. And I just wanted to share a few stories, and these are some of the things we keep hearing about from, uh, from each of you. One of you was studying to be a pastor, and then decided to break into business after taking HBS online. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we still need pastors, <laughs> okay? <laughs> uh, that was pretty amazing. And, and this person wrote, it wouldn't have happened without my experience 
I showed admissions that I was not only serious about business, specifically social enterprise, but I gave them another data point to prove I had the quant skills to withstand the rigor of the Georgetown Flex MBA program. One of you struggled through her first year in college, ultimately leaving, then coming back to earn her degree from the University of Michigan. <laughs> Sorry? There you go, Corey. Uh, to start Propeller Elective, Collective, a nonprofit dedicated to helping first generation or limited income students through college from matriculation to graduation. One of you is the epitome of a lifelong learner, and I'm not referring to Richard Pitts. After earning his bachelor's and master's degree, he went on to pursue a Google Developer Challenge Scholarship, working towards his doctorate of business administration, and before starting that, enrolled in CORE. After doing that, was selected by Forbes and J.P. Morgan Chase to join the Forbes Under 30 Scholars Program and received a Grow with Google Scholarship. These are just some stories. Another person had an amazing career in marketing, but she was really interested in sustainability, and she took Rebecca Henderson's course on sustainable business strategy and uh, now runs an e-commerce site called EcoImagine, which sells environmentally friendly goods, transforming plastic water bottles into soft leggings and cork bark into handbags and bracelets. One of you is the chief Adma advancement officer for uh, T1D Exchange, a nonprofit dedicated to addressing type 1 diabetes needed to learn how to grow this business. Another person is a biochemist turned artificial intelligence entrepreneur. These are just some stories. But every time we hear these stories, it shines a spotlight on all of you. Each of you can shine the spotlight on each and every one of you. That's the responsibility we take seriously. That's the responsibility we hope you take seriously. And I just want to remind you that when we started this endeavor, this project, this enterprise six years ago, um, you know, we were asking, what are we trying to do here? And it came back to the mission of Harvard Business School, which is we train and educate leaders who make a difference in the world. Um, we hope it's a positive difference, <laughs> uh, but it's a difference. And, and we really look to each and every one of you in the coming years to make that difference. So, um, so we'd love for you to share your stories with us as we go through this day and many others. Uh, Patrick referred to the Twitter handle, HBS Online Connect, and it would be wonderful, in fact, if you shared some story of yours with us today. I am here because, okay? Uh, while you're doing that, by the way, uh, since we last met, a few things happened. <laughs> uh, we did rebrand, um, and this was in some sense the coming of age of HBX. Uh, new course from Rebecca Henderson, three new courses in HPX Live. There's multiple new courses coming online in the next few years. This is pretty incredible. Last year with Virtual Connects, we launched Community. Uh, 6,500 current members in 29 chapters around the world, 84 events that you have self-organized. We've done nothing around that. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows which are the most uh, active communities. No? DC. Who's from DC? That is the most active community anywhere in the world. Okay, 130 people. Um, where are the others? <laughs> no, no. Tokyo, Sao Paulo. So this is literally happening everywhere, right? And, and again, this is your chance, not just to learn, but to meet and connect um, with each other. So I hope you have an amazing rest of the day. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting many of you. Uh, we have our faculty ready in the classrooms uh, after the, ne the next session to actually teach you and engage with, with you in conversation. Um, so enjoy the rest of the day and your time here. I hope you take the time to get to know each other a little bit and, and come and share your stories with us. Um, you inspire us every day, and we hope you continue to do that for many years uh, to come. With that, let me turn over to Patrick, uh, Malene, and two of um, our favorite colleagues, Nancy Kane and Joe Fuller, who are going to be engaged in conversation with you for the next hour. And the last thing I'll say is, when we think about community, we want to be able to think about community not just to get together, but to, but to act. And one of the things you'll see later on today is our first community challenge for all of you. More to come on that. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You guys ready? Okay. Okay. Come on up. Yeah, we'll just...
Hi again, everybody. Uh, we'll take our seats and we'll begin um, our discussion about uh, leadership and management. It says on my document here, it's a fireside chat. Um, I don't know where the fire is. Are we going to get up on the monitor there, one of those uh, little fake fires? So let me introduce uh, the guest to my left here. So first, I have Nancy Kane, immediately to my left. Uh, she's a historian here at Harvard Business School and holds the James E. Robinson Chair of Business Administration. Uh, her research focuses on effective leadership and how leaders, past and present, craft lives of purpose, worth, and impact, obviously relevant for our uh, theme today. Her newest book, Forged in Crisis, The Power of Courageous Leadership in Turbulent Times, spotlights how five of history's greatest leaders manage crises and what we can each learn from their experiences. Um, I recently read the book myself. Um, in fairness, I say read, but I listened to it uh, because I have a brutal commute, so I get a lot of time in the car. And Nancy actually reads her own book, which is a little unusual, so I got to hear your voice every morning for an hour, and on the way home <laughs> for an hour. Yes, yeah. thing. It's better than my wife yelling at me. So, um, But the book, the book is fantastic. Uh, I highly, highly recommend it. it. It's a great blend of, as the title implies, of history and modern thinking on leadership and translating those lessons from people who may seem very different than you uh, into your life, and she does a fabulous job of that. Uh, to her left is Joe Fuller. Uh, Joe is the professor of management practice in general management and co-leads uh, the Harvard Business School initiative Managing the Future of Work, as Barat mentioned. He's a graduate of HBS uh, and is the founder and first employee of the global concern consulting firm Monitor, which is now uh, Monitor Deloitte. And he's currently researching the evolution of the roles of CEOs and the C-suite in public companies. Uh, Joe, as Bharat uh, mentioned, and I just said a moment ago on the future of work, uh, has done some fascinating research there about how the world's changing, what it means in the future uh, for management and leadership. So two wonderful guests. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. So I'm going to start with Nancy here. And Nancy, uh, why don't you uh, kick us off here with what your definition of leadership is? So I'm a historian. Um, I get paid to read other people's mail. <laughs> I don't have a lot of guests in my HBS class because until we get to the end, they're all dead. <laughs> but, but, but because I'm a historian, I read just voraciously. And about six years ago, I stumbled on this definition of leadership. Um, and it's, it's, it starts with leaders, and I'm going to piece it together with the act, the activity of leadership. So this is the, the first part is from David Foster Wallace. Many of you will know him as a novelist and an essayist. And many years ago, in an article for Rolling Stone, he said, courageous leaders, effective leaders, worthy leaders are individuals who help us overcome the limitations of our own weaknesses and selfishness and laziness and fears and get us to do harder, better things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. So just let that marinate. <laughs> um, individuals who help us push through boundaries of laziness, selfishness, weakness, fears, get us to do harder, better things than we get, get ourselves to do on our own. Now, what does that mean in the context of our own apportioning of our energy and our talents and our experience, our learning? And, and, and this, this gets to Joe's question about what is the activity of leadership, and this definition comes from a faculty member who was here at the school for many years named John Cotter, who many of you will have heard of, who's a leadership expert and still is. John Cotter wrote many years ago, what, are le what is leadership? Leadership, he wrote, is the creation of positive non-incremental change, including the, the creation of a vision to guide that change, a strategy, the empowerment of people to make the vision happen despite obstacles, and the creation of a coalition right, of energy and momentum that can move that change forward. So that leaders who help us do that, and then what do we do if we're leading, according to Cotter, I think this is a darn good, good at least, you know, stake in the ground. We're, we're helping create non-incremental, worthy, powerful change. So that's, you basically have two definitions there, and I'm curious, this is always a challenge in the, in the area of leadership and management, is then Joe going to you. How would you compare and contrast the definition of management to these definitions of leadership? Well, I think there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of good managers who are coincidentally also good leaders, but there's not a universal intersection. Historically, management's been thought about as the responsibility for causing a group of people to accomplish some purpose. I think that's a, a rather 
you know, shallow definition and, and what I tell my students and of course I teach on general management is management is getting the confused, misguided, unmotivated, uh, misdirected to uh, accomplish a common purpose on a regular recurring basis. And I think uh, the, the ultimate intersection between leadership and management is an appreciation for what motivates and causes individuals to behave the way they do and the ability to draw out the best of them uh, with, a, with a purpose in mind. Now that can be a very mundane purpose of we've got lots of packages to get out of our warehouse today and we're going to do it in a timely, safe uh, fashion. Or it could be uh, something much more ennobling and, and, and much more uh, dramatic and memorable, uh, as Nancy points out in her scholarship. So actually, that uh, leads to a question that I had. So having read your book, and um, I'll, I'll pick Shackleton, because I think most people without reading the book are familiar with the story of Shackleton. Do people know that story, the story of the Antarctic explorer, Shackleton? Yeah. OK, Good. well, in your bag is the book. It's chapter <laughs> one. It's a really compelling, very dramatic story. And we put it first so that all the men that picked up the book would keep reading. <laughs> so you can find out about it. Go on. Well, it worked for me, because I, I did keep reading. Um, so yeah, so Shackleton uh, took an expedition around the turn of the century, or slightly later than that, actually around World War I, as I right, recall. Right, 1914. Yeah, and, uh, and gets stranded in the Antarctica for many, many months uh, and in an amazing story of survival and navigation and all sorts, and leadership. Uh, and management. And management, and that's where my question is going to go. Got everybody out of that situation, losing uh, none of his men along the way. So uh, that brings me to my question, which is, reading the book, it's easy to get absorbed in the leadership right. of Shackleton. Was he managing? Oh, all the time. So this, this story will, it's just jaw-dropping, and I know it very, very well, and I'm still in awe of it. Um, he's managing all the time. He's trying to keep 27 men alive. And he's also trying to keep, manage the energy and the morale because in some ways, one of his worst enemies, besides starvation and the elements, is the men that, that, you know, that in a sense, dissolve, divisiveness sets in, despair, ennui, and then we have a Lord of the Flies moment in which all kinds of really bad stuff can happen. So he's managing, for example, their daily routines. We've got to get stuff done. So he has a duty roster every day. We're going to get this done. It shifts every week to keep it different. Everyone has to walk around the iceberg five miles every day because he wants the, the, the positive energy effects, not to mention the physical benefits of exercise. He, he makes very uh, serious, careful decisions about who's going to be near whom in the tent assignment because the ship eventually goes down through the ice and they're living in tents. And dear, dear friends, they have no ways. They have no Instagram. Right, they have no text messaging, so they're really isolated. And, and he makes these decisions like, I'm good, for example, I'm going to put all the folks that are the naysayers in the group, all, you know who I'm talking about, all those people like, I can't do that. No way. <laughs> I'm going to put them in my tent, right? because he wants to manage the doubting Thomases, right? to keep them from contaminating the energy of the people around him. So you know, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. Or as an American president, Lyndon Johnson, once said in admittedly poetic form, better to have them inside the tent peeing outside than outside the tent peeing in. So he's, so he's managing right, his people, their daily routine, their food rations. He's managing all the time, at the same time thinking, how in the hell do we keep on taking steps to try and get them home safely? Well, I grew up in Texas. You sounded like one of my relatives there, so that was awesome. <laughs> uh, so Joe, uh, uh, pivoting off of that, and I, I, I think this is a tougher question, but maybe you'll tell me it's easy. So the flip side of that coin is, it, are there people in history that are great managers? I mean, is, is there that, and maybe I'm, I'm very curious about whether that Venn diagram, if it, if it doesn't intersect, do we, do we know of great managers who are horrible leaders? Great, great managers who are horrible leaders. I think there are many good managers who are not charismatic leaders. They're, they, are, they, they have a way about them that they can motivate people, but it's not in the way that I at least traditionally associate with, with uh, kind of epic leadership. And also, what I've, all, what I've observed as a reader of, of great historians like Nancy, their work, is that often leadership 
is a, both expression someone's ability and willpower, but also circumstance. And, and so I think there are multiple examples of, of great managers. Would they, um, you know, did they have the opportunity to be, uh, you know, emerge as a leader? Well, with someone like George Marshall, who was chief of staff of the United States Army during World War II, uh, a brilliant manager, uh, not a charismatic leader, but somewhat of great presence, uh, also a f a father of the Marshall Plan that many of you are familiar with. So there, there. Sometimes you get great managers who get in the in the circumstance. Uh, where they're able to also express leadership. But I think there, there are, in some ways, many good managers, um, uh, they're able to manage in part almost because they're not charismatic, because they're, they're, you know, they're not flamboyant, they're very calm, they're very controlled, um, their reaction to turbulence around them is actually to instill stability uh, and to not get distracted by the bright, shiny object. Uh, so, now, but it is, if, uh, I'm not sure I can sit here and say, let me, I'm going to name a brilliant manager who's just a god-awful leader. I, I, yep. That I can't do. Do you think, um, and I don't know if there's any research to support this one or the other, do you think, though, that there's very few great managers who don't have great, uh, excuse me, great leaders who don't have great managers working for them? Who don't have great managers working for Right, that part of the reason they become great leaders is because yep. they have those steady hands that are much more uh, maybe uh, tactical yes. yep. uh, working beneath them. Well, my sense, and I'm very interested to uh, be, have my sense confirmed or disconfirmed mm -hmm. by, by Nancy, is that one expression of leadership is the ability to understand what the people around you are capable of and how to call out the best of them. Absolutely. So that, uh, yes, I think that great leaders invariably have that capacity. And particularly, I think, and this is also an intersection with great executives, they are comfortable with what they are not very good at mm -hmm. and Absolutely. very, very comfortable vesting responsibility for that task, that activity, uh, even managing someone that they don't think can hear them and relate to them to giving that to someone else to do. They're, they're actually quite good delegators. Can I, may I just build on that as we say at HBS? Remember, <laughs> we grade on class participation in, in, the, in a lot of our classrooms. So we often get students, particularly their second year students, who will say, I'm going to build on something and then repeat someone's comment. So <laughs> I want to build on that because I think you are spot, I think you are spot on. Uh, I think that great leaders do a regular, I think this is just true of all, of all of you too, right? You're all leaders in the making, great managers in the making. I think it's incumbent on us if, to, to get over the, the, the ego hurdle and do a regular accounting of what are my weaknesses and what are my strengths. And then, as Jojo was saying, I think great managers and leaders, but particularly leaders, go out and find people that can fill the holes in, in your, uh, of your vulnerabilities and then empower them, as you just said. Again, I'm really building on Joe's comment. Empower them to get the work done. Mm -hmm. um, realizing that great organizations, great endeavors of whatever size, of whatever form, are ultimately about the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. right? And then the responsibility of the leader to, in a sense, try and create that and sustain it. What, um, one thing I'll often say, and I'd like you both to tell me I'm wrong or I'd like it better if you told me I'm right, actually. Um, but I've often said that every, and I've been a general manager for about 30 years, every business problem ultimately is a people problem. Is that true? Joe's much more qualified to answer that than I. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm wrong. Gen generally, yes, but, but, but uh, you know there are there are business problems that arise from circumstance that was it was so unanticipatable mm -hmm. or it, it was so outside the norm that uh, someone couldn't have anticipated it. But but that's rare. Mm -hmm. I mean, usually most business problems. If, if I were to kind of leave you with a thought about where business problems come from and where managerial problems come from, the number one source <clears throat> is a misplaced assumption. Hmm. That what you are doing is predicated on, on an assumption about something, the way the world works, what your customers want, how your competitors are gonna behave, what's motivating your people. 
and that you, you build a spun sugar, uh, you know, beautiful logic you know, d uh, right. structure on top of that faulty assumption and when it's disproven, you've got no foundation. Uh, and so the, the, to the e even, um, um, we used to always talk about, um, well, oil shocks. And so I, I can remember once when the, uh, the board of American Airlines got in trouble because they paid out their executive bonuses and despite the fact the airline was teetering on the brink of ba bankruptcy. And the, they explained it because the company was, was performing very badly financially because o oil prices had gone up dramatically. Therefore, the co cost of jet A had gone up dramatically, fuel for jets, and therefore management wasn't to blame. And I read that and I said, these guys don't understand the airline business. <laughs> because the, the board of directors doesn't because one of the, there are like five decisions you make as an airline executive. What aircraft to buy, you know, where to fly them to and from, and what's your strategy about energy prices. And if, you, if your strategy was to go naked with no hedges, that's a choice. That isn't, that isn't some circumstance that, oh my gosh, you know, we had lots of volatility in jet A prices, so therefore we're going to lose $5 billion. But management isn't to blame. <laughs> they made a big, big honking assumption, and it was proven wrong. That's really interesting. So mm. check your assumptions, uh, uh, you know, not at the coat room, but <laughs> daily. You know, it's a, I, w I once read a, a comment by somebody speaking about the airline industry and this exact point that said that every airline is really a hedging business on oil that happens on airplanes. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of truth to that because if you don't get that, to your point, get that right, you're in a world of hurt, right? Um, question, um, after reading your book, I'm reading right now a book about the USS Indianapolis. And for those who don't know the, about the story of the USS Indianapolis, it was a, a ship that delivered uh, the US's nuclear bomb to Tinian Island in the Pacific at the very end of World War II. A bomb ultimately dropped on Japan to end the war. After it did that, it was on its way to the Philippines and was sunk by a uh, Japanese submarine by a torpedo. And because of some mix-ups in management, <laughs> um, the Navy didn't know where the ship was and didn't think to go look for it. So um, several hundred men spent five days in the water uh, getting eaten by sharks and dying of thirst. I mean, it's a horrible, I, I gotta read more uplifting books uh, on my way to work out. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a horrible story, but, but your book came to mind in, in listening to that story, because one thing that happened was that commanders in each of these lifeboats, and they ended up in all these you know, disparate groups floating in the ocean. Um, the ones that seemed to maintain control of their troops were very diligent about this, we're gonna have an activity, right? So you're sitting in the water in a raft, and you know, your duty is to look out for airplanes for the next hour. Uh, your duty is to wash your own shirt, you know, things like that. Um, so it, and it makes sense, in, it, it sort of makes sense to me in a high stress, um, you know, situation like that. How does that though translate into, I mean, presumably none of you are spending five days in the water with sharks swimming around you every day at your job. And if you are, I'd love to hear, yeah, do the hashtag story. That's an interesting job. Yeah, right, <laughs> I'd love to hear about that. Um, but how, how does that discipline translate into, you know, running a software company or working at a bank or whatever? Well, this, let me answer this historian and then a little bit more, kind of take the history down to the place that we, where we sit here at Harvard Business School. Um, I think the times we're living in, and remember, I get paid to see the big cycles of history. Mark Twain once said, the past doesn't, doesn't replicate itself precisely, but sometimes it does rhyme. So my job is to look for the rhymes and then help folks like you use those rhymes with, of the past with today or with today with the past to, to lead your life and use your gifts. Um, and we're living in a time of unbelievable volatility. No, it's not sharks, but you just look at the huge drivers of disruption right now. Everything from climate change to geopolitical unrest to demographic shifts to massive social change all over the world. And those are just, I'm, I'm just at the top of the list. There's another six or seven that are major, that are moving around the tectonic plates of our world. In all that VUCA, right, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, the job of all of us now is actually to stay focused and grounded. Focus and grounded. And we all know what I'm talking about now. How many start to read a, a, a news story 
on your f or a book on your phone or on in the paper and find you have to read the first paragraph about five times. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Right, or how many of you catch yourself listening to a friend or a colleague and then you have to actually ask them to repeat it? Because even though they spoke perfectly clearly and w with empathy, you didn't hear them. So we ha focus, and dis focus and grounding require discipline. I'm not sure that routine in some sense for all of us, actually like Shackleton or like these commanders in the lifeboats, isn't getting more important. Mm. Right, because to walk our best path, to access our stronger core, we have to have a way of focusing our mind, our heart, our head, our emotional intelligence, and moving it forward in relation to others, in relation to our vision, in relation to our path, and do that, in a, and that requires discipline, and stay on the ground, and not get too caught up in the whirl of the VUCA, or the whirl of social media, or whatever it, it is that makes us spin. This is really, really important. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I think these, these commanders, whether it's Shackles or these other folks, their lessons are actually more important today yeah, than they say were 20 years ago. Yep. Awesome. I, by the way, while I'm uh, remembering, uh, just a reminder, uh, please start shooting questions you might have uh, for uh, Nancy and Joe to hashtag HBS online connects with an X. Raise your hand if you've already done one. Oh, that's, da that's sad. Now, come on. All right, I'm going to ask again in five minutes. I want to see at least 20 hands go up, OK? Um, Joe, I want to transition to kind of we, the, the area we discussed earlier or mentioned in your intro that you're spending a lot of time on this future of work. Uh, first of all, can you define for everybody what, you, what we mean when we say studying the future of work? Well, as Nancy alluded to, there are multiple uh, factors influencing both the way work is done and what's required of people at work. It's everything from changing demographics to um, the nature of technological change and how that's expressing itself in the workplace. Uh, it's uh, where, who is obtaining what levels of education where in the world. And uh, with a similar, the, the uh, modesty that we uh, are famous for here at Harvard <laughs> Business School. Uh, what we have done is launch a project where we're trying to understand all those forces in an integrative fashion so we can talk to decision makers, senior executives, ministers, uh, governors, uh, about how do they think about all of those things as an integrated challenge. So if you're a I was with um, uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Ohio yesterday, who is has this mandate uh, under Governor DeWine, who's a sitting governor. And if you're running the state of Ohio, or if you're running Cardinal Health in the state of Ohio, you have to think about several things at once. First of all, who do I currently employ and what can they do? And what, I'm gonna, what am I gonna need them to do in the future? Where am I going to source the type of talent I don't have, but I'm going to need? Quick aside, it's remarkable, but almost nobody applies supply chain management principles to sourcing talent. Now, we don't want to think of people like ball bearings or corrugated cardboard, but it works when you've got a vendor to tell the vendor that they're shipping you defective product. So if you're going to hire from local school system and the graduates of those schools regularly can't do something that, that's so impactful on their ability to be productive work for you, you may want to pass that upstream to your supplier of talent. Um, another quick one is how do you mander, uh, manage gender in the workforce? In the United States, 80% of the jobs created since the end of the Great Recession are for college graduates or above. Women are an absolute majority of college enrollees, master's degree enrollees, and PhD in enrollees, medical school students, the, the works. But if you go into a large company in the United States and look at the basic logic of job descriptions and career paths, it's firmly rooted in 1960s, 1950s paradigm of uh, I, there are two adults in a household, one of them essentially dedicates themselves entirely to work outside the home, the other entirely to work inside the home. And if you are, and, and, and to get to advance here, you have to show up at eight o'clock and be prepared to stay at eight o'clock and be prepared to be 
uh, transferred four or five times geographically and be prepared to be on the road two or three or four days a week some parts of the year. And that's in that paradigm of, of uh, a 1960s television show, that, that might have worked. It does not work in uh, a, a generation of workers today who are often in what's called the sandwich situation. They've got kids, they've got seniors they're also responsible for. They're both working. Uh, and they're unable to to kind of uh, fit into this into this uh, very very kind of normalized system of advancement and progression in companies. Mm. Um, so we we work with and collaborate with all sorts of outside entities. We love the research that are done at other schools, like one across the river uh, at MIT, where they're doing great work on how very high levels of technology affect high paying jobs. That's, that's one consideration of many, many, many we're trying to weave together in an integrated framework for discussing this with decision makers. I want to come back to that in a moment. One thing that, uh, talking about the gender um, issue that uh, piqued the question in my mind thinking about your book again, is um, uh, I think is Rachel, is it Rachel? Uh, so Car the, Car last, yeah. the last story, it's a storybook of five people who made themselves into amazing, iconic leaders. The last story is the only woman in the book, mm -hmm. um, a woman named Rachel Carson who wrote arguably one of the most, if not the most important book published in English in the 20th century called Silent Spring. I don't know if any of you have read that book. If you haven't, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. <laughs> Get ye online or wherever you buy a book and take a look at it. It's an extraordinary book about environmental responsibility, environmental sustainability, and the stewardship we owe the earth. It was published in 1962. So she was prophetic, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I found, uh, what I found fascinating about that, given what you just said, Joe, is all, you know, 1962, the book was published. Right. You talked about going to these companies that have basically theories of, of management development that were written when she was writing, writing this it. book. Um, and yet she found a voice in a time when it was even more difficult Absolutely. for a woman to found, find a voice. I'm curious as to some of the qualities that you think so, led, that, led to that. So interestingly, I think she in some ways is the most impressive leader in the book. And her company includes Abraham Lincoln, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and Frederick Douglass, as well as Shackleton. One of the things, and she was a shy and retiring person. Mm -hmm. No charisma, no, no overt aggression. She was shy and retiring. She wrote all her own talks and everything herself. She was, she never married, she, but, so she was, and yet, she was arguably as powerful as any president, almost any president in U.S. history, and as many, many other leaders in, the, in world history. Um, and yet, here are some of the things I have learned after I wrote the book that have really struck me about her, and this is to your gender question. She cared for her birth family, including her nieces and grandnephew, all her life, her mother, her father, her sisters, her brothers, her nieces and, and then grandnephew. Um, she was a great, she was a person of great nurturing and caretaking. And it's only been since I wrote the book that I've come to see that the kind of work she did, which was about stewardship of the earth in practical, economically feasible stewardship, was actually rooted in her nurturing. We never talk about leadership as being caretaking. We never talk about leadership as being about our nurturing capabilities, but what are you doing when you build a business and bring people along in that? You're nurturing. You're giving birth to an enterprise, taking it out of the ether. What are you doing when you get the best out of people? You're caring for them. You are developing them. So I've come to think that enormous power that we all have that we don't necessarily think of, almost like ruby slippers in the Wizard of Oz, these un acknowledged assets as our capacity for caretaking and nurturing. And this is really powerful in her story. And you come to see the extraordinary impact it has on all kinds of more charismatic leaders. Mm. There, there are eight or nine attributes we isolate in a course I teach in our MBA program about good managers. And one of them is regularly expresses interest in the career path and personal life of subordinates. So I think this notion of the leader or the manager as someone who has that nurturing side, it doesn't necessarily have to be arm around the shoulder and 
uh, lots of uh, soothing, encouraging words, but all we've demonstrated to their subordinate that, uh, not always, but periodically, regularly expresses to their subordinates an interest in their career development, their life circumstances, what work means to them. Great, and um, I have a question, so thank you very much. Um, but one last question for me um, that uh, the last response has got me thinking about. Um, to the extent that people often will have this vision of a great leader um, as this charismatic, uh, you know, hand on the back of the shoulder sort of person, um, how has modern social media, or is, has it changed what people view to be a good leader? I mean, maybe this is just an opinion versus research, but I'm curious as to your thoughts on that. Well, I have a very strong opinion. So oh, good. Why don't we start with Joe? Good. Let's hope Joe I'm, disagrees. I'm, we always say we. I'm, I'm surprised to hear that Nancy's got a strong opinion. Uh, <laughs> so um, I would say that by and large, it's a curse uh, because um, it it uh, it provokes. The, the, the monotony of it and the, the universality of it and the constant, constant both opportunity or obligation to be expressing opinions, views, uh, I think is um, both detracts from one's actual leadership credibility. People, I think one, one of the, my observations about leadership is their sense of timing where and when and how to articulate a message is profoundly important. And I think that's true of managers too. So if managers are constantly jabbering about something, it just gets diluted in, in, in this flood of, of, of messages we get. And also, the, 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 particularly for more senior managers, I think they very often forget that um, their workforce, their customers, their suppliers, other constituents speak a different dialect. And, and that people who speak exquisite, fluent senior management, uh, it's like listening to formal, uh, very elegant uh, Arabic as spoken in uh, one of the great universities, let's say in Egypt. But if you then go to a souk in, in Syria or it, to, to one in Morocco, uh, it's mutually intelligible, but a lot of the nuance is lost, and it sounds old-fashioned and stilted. That's very, very often, like C-suite executives uh, are absolutely convinced that, that you know, they can explain economic reality to their workforces and they're, 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 they're preaching, you know, they're, they're speaking this highly stylized, uh, you know, patois that's only understood by Wall Street analysts, boards of directors, and other CEOs. And your strong opinion is? I think in general, social media is making us all poorer leaders and poorer managers by some measure, and with acceler at an accelerating tempo. I think there are a number of reasons. You've highlighted several important ones. I think there may be some others. One is it, it becomes largely, not completely, but it, it's, it's so relativistic and it becomes very narcissistically focused over and over. Whether it's tweets and retweets and hearts and likes and Instagram pass, whatever it is, we're keeping score largely for egotistically driven reasons. All of you know in your hearts and in your minds that great leadership and great management is not driven primarily and, and mostly by a narcissistic gas tank. In fact, I think really great leaders and managers discover right, the relation to our own satisfaction and how it is often found doing something bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. Building a business, founding a nonprofit to help people get through school, their first years of college, right? Cure, dealing with diabetes and the, and the challenges of this extraordinary disease and the related epic of obesity. Right, raising a child. So most great leadership and most great management has that anchor as well. Those anchors are far and few between, my dear friends, on social media. Mm. It is also making us very, very, making our attention spans go to Nat's eyelashes and making us fractured 
It's not that we don't want to be able to do lots of different things. That's our life. But we want to be able to, be, to, be, to have the emotional intelligence and the grounding to do those well and more often than not thoughtfully and with integrity. And I don't think a lot of those qualities we're going to find you know, racing back and forth. And I'm as guilty as anybody, so I don't say this in a sanctimonious way. We're going to find racing back and forth between our social media accounts. There's a dark side here to this technology, and we want to be knowledgeable and thoughtful about it, using and developing our emotional intelligence toward that end. A little awkward transition, but please don't forget to tweet your questions to hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we actually have a question. So thank you very much to all of you for sending some questions. Uh, how do you strike a balance between leading and managing a team to the extent that you have to strike a balance, I suppose? Well, um, I think you manage a team 724 and you lead it occasionally. And, and um, it's, um, uh, I think the hardest half there is to make sure that the posture you strike as a leader uh, is uh, consistent with and, and recognizable to the people you work with uh, as an express expression of your management. It's not, I'm leading now, so... You know, <laughs> stand back, wait, here comes the leader. The, trumpet. the leader the version magic. of Joe is about to be unleashed. Uh, but, you know, I think, as I, as I suggested earlier, and, and, and I'm presuming to, to draw on what Nancy said, too, leadership expresses itself in certain sets of circumstances, and management expresses itself every day. Um, hey, Lauren, uh, keep that question up, but I'm going to go back to one you had put up earlier uh, that um, I'll ask you, Nancy, yeah. which was, uh, I think I saw it earlier, and I'll get it correct here. Um, is there a leader you have studied who failed spectacularly, uh, and yeah, what did they what did they learn from it? Did they learn from it, and what can we learn from a situation like that? Um, I, I have stu well, we should tell you what you already know that we're, we do a lot of our learning, as you all well know, based on case studies. The problem with studying people who lose spectacularly is they're not that keen to tell <laughs> you their story. Yeah. So we don't have as many stories of of massive failure as we would like, because you do learn a lot in failure. I'll give you an example of someone I studied in great detail when I was writing another storybook for my tenure um, uh, case uh, called Brand New. It's about entrepreneurs that built great brands. Um, and one of them was Henry Hines, the ketchup and pickle king. He failed massively twice. I mean, when I say failed massively, the second bankruptcy, they took his furniture <laughs> and his house Right, and he went to live with his in-laws, and they had no money for Christmas presents. It was it was it was nasty, and it was very def absolutely debilitating from him. He kept diaries, so we know his his emotions at the time, and what he learned was a whole bunch of things that were partly managerial. Uh, keep a careful eye on cash flow when you're a growing business, so that right receivables don't don't so that your receivables keep pace with your payables. Right, that was that was lesson number one. Right. That's a, that's a big one. That's a big one, right? We, we, we have started our finance courses since time immemorial on that lesson. Um, a second lesson, managerial lesson, choose your colleague, your partners, very carefully, based partly on what you don't have and they do, but also partly on their own proclivity, their own tolerance for risk and change. This is something that's really important in our age, right? Our service management colleagues like to say, hire for attitude, train for mm -hmm. skill. Mm -hmm. And that was an important piece he learned. And then I think he learned something else really interesting emotionally, and this maybe is more in the leadership category. How can I not only learn from my mistakes managerially, but how do I develop enough resilience inside myself that I'm not thrown completely off kilter when the winds whip and the waves rise? And so he learned stuff inside and out that was important, I think, to his leadership and to his management. And he would never have learned those lessons with such power, because we are always more eager, serious learners when we're living with shame. And he bore a lot of shame for the failure, and if he had not failed. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned, I always tell people that I don't remember much from my MBA here, but there's two things I remember is uh, companies only go out of business because they ran out of cash, and money now is better than money later. 
cost me a lot of money to learn those two lessons, <laughs> but uh, it's worked out okay. Um, so you gave us money early, and then you then, got there you go. Yeah, yeah. It worked out for us. The other thing that I took from your lesson about Heinz mm -hmm. is that you have to move in with your in-laws. You're going to be really motivated to create an empire. <laughs> 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 All right. So. Um, Another great question, um, and I actually brought this up, I think, uh, in an email to both of you when we were planning this, is this idea, it's an age-old question, yeah, yeah. is leadership, uh, the way the question's phrased, is leadership a mindset, can it be learned, uh, does it require constant practice, you know, said another way, you, uh, or adding to that, are you born with it, do you develop it, there's lots of opinions on that, so fire away. Uh, I, am, I would bet my horses, my handbags, my family, they're not that important to me in that exact way. <laughs> uh, but things very dear, my faith, very dear to me on the, on, the, on, the, on the absolute certainty that leaders are made, they're not born. And it does require constant work. Many years ago, A.G. Lafley, who all of you will know as the two-time CEO of Procter & Gamble, uh, I, was, I interviewed him to ask him what he'd learned as a leader from Abraham Lincoln. And the first words out of his mouth, he knew a lot about Lincoln. Very articulate, understated, very calm guy who was also a good manager. Very, creating, talking about creating stability with the rhetorical, developed rhetorical capabilities that you were alluding to, Barat. He said, great leaders are made from these three ingredients. First is a combination of nature and nurture, right? What you could, the, the endowments you come into the world with, plus what you accumulate as you walk your path, the mileage of life. Second ingredient, a moment arises that the individual recognizes, demands their leadership. That's the second ingredient. We're looking up. We're not just on our phones. If we're going to see a moment, we have to look up and see it, put the pieces together. But the third ingredient, and Lafley was very careful to say they're all equally important, is that the individual has to decide for him or herself to embrace the cause and get in the game. I think that's a really powerful definition. And all the, I've been studying leaders since I got here. I'm, I was a little young filly then. And now like I'm aging as we speak. <laughs> but I can tell you with great certainty that everyone I have studied, living and dead, made themselves. And I mostly study good leaders, successful, worthy leaders, full of light. They made themselves capable of that. And they did it day by day. Right? They did it thinking about their own development and their ambition to have a worthy impact almost every day. And they all failed many more times than they succeeded. But it isn't about the, the tally card of failures and successes. It's about the impact that you're building and the strength you're gathering inside yourself to exercise that impact that really counts when we talk about great leadership. Let me ask you a question, Joe, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm going to give you a chance to answer that one. Um, can you be a real jerk? and be a good leader. And, and I ask <laughs> this question questions. because I've been shocked at the people I've worked for in my life. Nobody here, and I'm not kidding here, it's been wonderful working here, but I've worked, I'm sure this, how many of you think you've worked for just the biggest jerk in the world and it just perplexes you that they're as successful as they are? Look at Pretty that. Pretty much everybody, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, it does beg the question, I think, um, A, why does, how does it happen? Uh, are we all just kind of too soft and we don't understand what good leadership is? Um, you know, what leads to these sorts of people having success? Well, I mean, there are some famous, famous um, uh, executives and business leaders that, that would um, uh, maybe even relish being characterized yeah. as mm -hmm. jerks. Um, Steve Jobs was an, apparently an epically yeah. <laughs> uh, jerky person. I, I, I think more <laughs> colorful words, but... Um, I think the, the, there are several things that um, lead to that. Uh, one is that they are just exceptionally skilled at what I'm going to describe as the main sequence task of the business. Mm. So in so, Apple's case, like design and... So he, he had a preternaturally great sense for design and had studied design going back to when he was at Reed College and, and, and loved it. Uh, and... Um, and that became the essence of that brand and the essence of, of their strategy. And uh, that allowed him to continue to succeed despite the fact that I would argue often made that success harder to achieve and maybe even detracted a little bit from his potential success mm -hmm. because of that. Yeah. I think another thing that uh, being jerkiness is in the eye of the beholder, right? 
And, and very often I think people that come across as jerks despite being successful at what they do is um, have done a very poor job of articulating how they view the task and how they, um, how they ex expect their colleagues to go about it. So the objective function is less clear. Um, very often someone that in managerial situations is causing a lot of friction. It's got to do with a misalignment of incentives, uh, both vertically and horizontally. And always, I'm, I'm doing a little demi version of my my MBA course here. <laughs> the the the, in the, the the almost the least important of the incentives is who's going to get paid, how much, when. It has to do with. Uh, rewards and punishments in the organization, what gives you stature, what gives you satisfaction, uh, what gives you the prospect of advancement, what, what gives you voice in the organization. And, um, uh, but the, the truth of the matter is that, that if you're going to be a, a, a successful manager consistently, you're going to do that by motivating people to perform at their highest level consistently, and that cannot be done by duress and by copying an attitude and being condescending and, 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 and being mono, kind of monochromatic in what you can do just that one task. So being, it usually catches up to them eventually, so have faith. Uh, many of you raised your hands, we'll see that person mm -hmm. go by the wayside. You know, I, I once, I, a faculty member when I was here once said in the classroom, I don't remember who it was, but um, it's okay to be lucky, it's okay to be smart, it's not okay to be lucky and think you're smart. And I, I think that's, I, in my own experience, that seems to have been a great, uh, good leaders recognize that there are many elements that might contribute to their success. Mm -hmm. Those are the right. ones that always came off to me as not being the jerk. Yeah. 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 Would you agree that? It Absolutely. Like, yeah. I was just saying to Joe, excuse me, including circum the circumstances, yeah. the context, the moment that's mm -hmm. arisen, they're very conscious of all the different pieces that mm -hmm. go into it. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of second acts in management at CEO level that fail because yeah. the, 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 that person got a reputation for being able to manage well and solve problems of a certain type, but it was it was circumstance, it would maybe the surround, the, the subordinates around them. Um, you, know, you asked earlier, can, can, can you know, are leaders made or they, or, they, or they just exist? Managers are definitely made. Yeah. Hmm. You know, there, there's no question that it is something that benefits hugely from repetition and experience and, and, and guidance from other people who have done it. And um, the, the uh, there's kind of when, when you someone who is a good manager who fails in the in after they get promoted or moved to another circumstance, it's it's usually because they they you know, they're perfectly designed to hit a golf ball and now they're being asked to hit a tennis ball and they're both sports, you know, that would involve yep. taking a, a you know some implement and hitting a ball. But as all of you know, who play either or both those sports are pretty different. Yeah. I, uh, one of my faculty members when I was here that I really did love, I love a lot of them, but uh, Richard Tedlow, a historian oh. like you. And I remember one thing he pointed out, and I, I'll get the names wrong, but like, you know, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, um, give me another one from that area. You know, Jay Gould. Yeah, that, that they were all born, and this may not be those mm -hmm. exact people, but um, born within like five years of each other. And he pointed out that they, so much of their success revolved around the fact that technology progressed yeah. enough to, for railroads, you know, the financing of them, the building of yeah. them, things like that. So the context matters a, 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 a ton. Hell of a lot. We have time, I think, for maybe out. one more question. Oh, in fact, I'm getting the five minute warning here. Um, actually, the, uh, the, the question before I want to go yeah, back to really quickly. Good. Yes, you remember what it was? Yeah, you it was want to about it? how you do you answer. discern between, how does a good leader discern between doing the right thing versus the effective mm -hmm. thing? I think that's a really interesting question. So. My hat's off to you for <laughs> offered that up to us. Um, I'm just going to take a, try and take an uncharacteristically succinct, make an uncharacteristically succinct response. I think doing the right thing has a great deal to do with owning the responsibility of the decision. The right thing. So here's, I'm choosing this, and I'm choosing it because I recognize what the responsibility I have is, which means, by the way, I haven't made a completely you know, isolated choice. I've made a choice that may have these consequences. These are the best estimate I can make as to those repercussions. I own that responsibility. And, we, and the, the literature of business history in this country is, is rife with examples of leaders who 
in the moment thought they did the effective, often short-term, economically feasible decision, but never owned the responsibility. We can talk about everything from the Explorer Ford problem to the problems that General Motors had three years ago when Mary Barra took up the scepter as CEO with ignition problems, to many other examples of companies in effect, in effect leaders, managers making a single decision and then not saying, what are the consequences of this, including the consequences of deciding not to decide. Pass it, kicking the can is still a decision. So I think effective is something that has a shorter half-life and doesn't necessarily carry real grounded responsibility. You want to add anything to the show? Um, all I'd, I, I would say that, that um, I just want to pick on one thing that, that uh, Nancy referenced, a bit of a tangent, but I think very effective managers and leaders um, understand when deferring a decision is the right course of action and that we tend to celebrate people for being decisive. Uh, very often the best decision you can, can make is to await further developments. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sorry, I'm just, I just said, can I say something? <laughs> I could not. You're mic'd up so people probably okay. heard you whisper. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I could not agree more. One of my worries, historians get paid to worry, is that we're all acting way too quickly and we think we have to take action, especially when our emotions get charged up. I'll give you just one tiny example of when sometimes the best, most powerful thing a leader or manager can do is to do absolutely nothing in the heat of the moment. Can I give you one example of this? All right, so very briefly. Right after the Battle of Gettysburg, this is July of 1863, Lincoln gets a note, a telegraph from the, the general who was leading the, United, the, the government forces, the northern forces, which had won that battle, three days, 50,000 men killed or wounded, right? Which had won, which the north had won by the hair of their chinny chin chin. And the commanding general sends a telegraph to Lincoln the day after in Washington, it was fought in Pennsylvania, the battle, saying, Mr. Lincoln, dear Mr. President, I decided not to pursue the defeated army of Robert E. Lee because my soldiers were too tired, okay? Lincoln was absolutely furious. I mean, I can feel him when I read this letter. You can Google it, it's online, it's, his handwriting is beautiful. You can feel his, his anger in the letter. And he gets angrier and angrier. You can just feel him, like sitting at your computer. Okay, here I go. <laughs> and he, he writes a, a very, ultimately a very scathing letter that excoriates General Meade, the commanding general. And then he folds the letter up and puts it in his desk. And it's found after he died. On the back it says, Abraham Lincoln to George Meade, July 5th, 1863, never signed, never sent. And I know why he didn't send the letter. He didn't send the letter because if he alienated this general who had just put in command, he had no one in the wings. It's a long story. You can read about it in chapter two of Forged in Crisis. But he had no one left. He had no other managers he could call on. So he couldn't take the risk. And I always say to my executives I coach and my students, what if Lincoln had had email or social media and just hit send? <laughs> the course of world history might have been different. So sometimes the best decision is to do nothing in the heat of the moment. With that, let's just have uh, to wrap it up. I'm going to give you guys a very difficult task. So in our theme of business with purpose for this event, um, one, maybe two sentences about the intersection of leadership and purpose um, that you think is a, a great takeaway, the thing you want people to remember about this discussion as they leave this auditorium and go to their cases. Well, maybe I'll do management okay. yeah. and, and purpose. Yeah. I think that that um, the historically management has been driven by goals, and uh, the set of legitimate and important objectives any organization is going to have is getting longer and more complex. And delivering that is going to become more and more challenging because the workforce of and the way we structure working relationships historically do not reflect both the rate of technological change and demographic change, but also the, the, the purpose as felt by workers. So 
managers in the future are going to be dealing with a much longer array of objectives and a much more complex set of challenges to, to motivate mm. yeah. their colleagues and workers to achieve those purposes. Mm. Finding a purpose that's authentic and worthy and incites your passion and, and motivates you to find your strongest self because you really believe this is the, this is the, the North Star for you is everything. It is the gas, it is the resilience, it is the discipline to hone your gifts and use your experience to squeeze the very marrow out of this turbulent, extraordinarily promising and extraordinary, equally perilous world that we live in. And you don't necessarily get an app that says find your purpose all set. <laughs> So keep on looking and keep on sensing and keep on, and it's not on your phone, I guarantee it. So it's mostly going to be found with your fellow people in often messy ways, and sometimes you just stumble on it. But keep looking, it's there. And all the people I've ever studied stumble into it and not in a kind of preordained perfect mm. way. It's messy. All important stuff is messy. But don't stop looking. The world has never needed you more with your purpose than it does right now. Excellent final words. I want you all to sit. Applause, please, for our two guests. They are wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both Thank very you much. It was great. awesome. So, uh, Thank you so much. Really, really awesome. I look forward to this event every year because I get as much out of it, I think, as our participants by speaking with folks like you. So thanks very much for making the time on a Saturday to do this. Um, although it's not like you're going to be out you know, sunbathing or anything. It's a little cool. <laughs> So uh, two quick announcements. One is we found a credit card for, a, forgive me if I pronounce this name incorrectly, uh, Jia Wang. Uh, it's in the coat room. I'm sure we'll require you to show some ID to say it's your credit card. Um, and uh, with that, our next activity is our cases. Please make your way immediately to Aldrich Hall, which is uh, kind of out a little bit diagonally that direction, big uh, red brick building with curved windows on the outside. And we'll see you all there for your cases. Thank you. <laughs>